the Army Combat Uniform, the Marine Corps Combat Utility Uniform, the Battle Dress Uniform, and its desert variants, the DBDU and DCU, Vietnam-era jungle fatigues, and just cargo pants in general. What do all these US uniforms have in common? Well, quite simply, a number of pockets on the jacket, with most of the chest ones being slanted, and large cargo pockets on the pants. From a basic standpoint, one can deduce that each of these simply took elements from its predecessors, but where did it start? What was the progenitor piece that influenced all of these? It's the US Army's parachute jumpers uniform, more commonly known by its unofficial designations of the lesser seen M41 and more famous M42, used during the second half of the Second World War. The jump in technology between the First and Second World Wars brought about a number of changes to the battlefield be it advancements in small arms, tank and armored transport, naval vessels, tactics, you name it, and chances are good it progressed leaps and bounds over the 21 years between the end of the Great War and Germany's invasion of Poland. However, one of the most significant came in the way of aviation and the tactics that could be employed along with it. Seeing a series of demonstrations and exercises throughout the 1930s by the Soviets, Italians, and a handful of other countries, many who became directly involved during World War II were quick to utilize the rapidly developing airborne strategy. Though the U.S. did play around with small-scale airborne operations and experiments through the 1930s, it wasn't until July 1, 1940 did things truly kick off with the formation of the Parachute Test Platoon from the 29th Infantry Regiment, which consisted of 48 men who essentially paved the way for all future U.S. paratroopers. It was here most of the elements associated with airborne soldiers, be it procedure, tactics, equipment, and uniforms, were ironed out. At the start, there was no official jump uniform, be it for training purposes or otherwise. And so the test platoon and the early trainees that followed used what they felt were adequate enough while an official one was being created. This came in the form of a series of coveralls such as the Herringbone Twill Army Air Corps Type B1 Mechanics coveralls, all black ones often worn by instructors during certain training activities, and even generic blue denim ones. Officials knew these pieces would not be suitable long term or for actual combat, but felt that a one piece suit was the way to go design wise. And so the initial idea was for the Quartermaster Corps to design a new or more efficient one for airborne forces. Enter the experimental balloon cloth coveralls. Being made of a green, tightly woven polished cotton, though sometimes referred to as satin or silk, but most commonly balloon cloth, these pieces focus more on aerodynamics and other factors related to the relatively new concept of troops jumping out of airplanes, such as wind and temperature resistance. The problem was it was extremely impractical with the other primary element troops would encounter combat once on the ground, as it was quickly revealed to be very visible due to the fabric sheen, which easily reflected light giving the wearer's position away. On top of that, the material was prone to snagging on anything from gear to tree branches. Throw in its ill-designed pockets and zipper that often caught on itself, as well as the fabric around it, and you had yourself a potentially fatal uniform. After a number of field tests and subsequent modifications related to not only the material but the concept of a one-piece coverall design as a whole, the drawbacks and issues pertaining to to them became blatantly obvious. They were constricting and limiting and thusly dangerous overall. This inevitably led to the concept being ditched entirely in early 1941. With the One Piece concept out, officials were back to square one, but they didn't have to look far as the idea of a two-piece suit had been suggested by Captain William Yarborough, who, with the help of five other officials of the Provisional Parachute Group, as well as tailors of Fort Banning, began working on them. Certain things were considered, and even stated by Yarborough when designing this new two-piece suit, such as being able to perform activities better with the top removed, pockets on the pants actually being able to fit specific items such as K-rations, which were used as a reference, and the top resembling that of a bush jacket. A number of concepts were designed, such as these seen here, often referred to as parachute jumpers suit modification numbers 1, 2, and 3. As you can see, their overall designs were slowly moving forwards towards what would inevitably become the M42s. Each one presented drawbacks, but also elements that would either be incorporated or approved upon down the line. Most of these concepts were almost universally disliked, with the exception of the lower waist pockets seen on the jacket, which were viewed favorably. Eventually, after continual trial and error, a design was officially accepted and gained the designation of coat parachute jumper and trousers parachute jumper, respectfully, but it is now often referred to by its collector's name of Model 1941, M41 for short, due to its creation in well, 1941. Not to be confused with the M41 field jacket, this uniform took a number of elements from its predecessors, as well as a number of new ones too. 
The jacket included shoulder tabs, a zippered front closure with a double snap button collar, a small pocket at the top of the front zipper where a soldier could store a pocket knife, a belt that was sewn directly onto the back of the jacket that included a single snap button at its end which could be used to secure it, a pleated back, arm cuffs which were secured by two snap buttons each, a hook loop on the inside to hang it, and most uniquely four torso pockets, two on the chest, and two by the waist. Now, this design was very much tethered to the safari and bush style jackets as mentioned before in that it maximized carrying items. However, the problem was the pockets as they were patch ones, those being made up of a shallow, straightforward single piece of fabric sewn right onto garments that didn't allow much expansion, meaning there was limited storage and carrying capability. Additionally, the pocket flaps were designed in a rather odd way. Though the chest pockets were slanted downwards towards the front zipper, the flaps were tapered in the opposite direction, seeing the narrower section at the lower part of the pocket, with the wider up towards the arms where the single snap button was placed to keep them closed. This strange design gave it a unique look, but between the inner side of the flap hanging free and the wider single snap button on the other end, it was not the most user friendly. The waist pockets saw a similar concept, though on a much less drastic level, as they were not angled, and because they were overall larger in size, the flaps were too, allowing for much easier grasping. Moving down to the pants, they were pretty straightforward, seeing a button fly, belt loops around the waist, seven pockets, two front inset waist ones, a single small inset on the wearer's right up by the waist, two rear inset ones, each secured by a single button, and two large cargo ones on each leg, which two featured an angled flap, which was straight rather than curved and was secured by two snaps. Finally, the legs were tapered downwards and each featured a vertical zippered closure. This uniform seemed to have been issued in small numbers with a few being produced by Fort Benning tailors and most of the others by the Philadelphia Quartermaster. These were used primarily during training and exercises but were most often worn for magazine and propaganda purposes, though there appear to be instances of them in use during the war alongside the M42s, often by officers. To what extent and through what years remains somewhat elusive. However, two unique examples of their use long after their replacement, as well as in combat, were recorded by way of Lieutenant Jack Pogue, who was captured in Avellino, Italy in September of 1943, and more famously by Colonel George Van Horn Mosley Jr., commander of the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division, who jumped into Normandy on June 6, 1944, during the D-Day operation, in which he was wounded but refused to be taken off the battlefield, instead electing to continue overseeing his men via a wheelbarrow for two days before ultimately returning to the U.S. to oversee training more paratroopers. Anyway, though the M41s had been a step in the right direction with many who wore them viewing them favorably, it still had a few drawbacks such as the way the pockets and their flaps were designed, which made them limited in what they could carry, as well as being a bit hard to open and close. And so the coat, parachute jumper, and trouser parachute jumper were replaced with the coat, parachute jumper, and trouser parachute jumper second pattern, essentially the same designation, but noticeably different design. Now, most commonly known as the M1942, or simply M42, this new uniform saw many of the same features as the M41 and its predecessors carried over, such as the slanted pockets, knife pocket by the collar, waist belt, and longer torso section of the jacket, but also improved upon many areas as well. The biggest changes with the jacket were, the pockets were billowed and pleated rather than patch ones, allowing for much more carrying space. Additionally, the flaps tapered in the opposite direction and to an acceptable and beneficial level with each end secured by two snaps. Two were seen on either side, allowing for a little more space for items if need be. Additionally, the rear pleat continued below the belt, ending at the bottom, forming essentially a coat tail. The waist belt was no longer sewn onto it, but rather connected by a single small strip on the back, and the snap button at the belt's end was done away with. In regards to the pants, not much was altered, really seeing only the thigh cargo pockets being updated in the same way as the ones seen on the jacket, that being billowed with a pleat, with an updated flap and four snap buttons, and the lower leg zippers being removed and replaced with a triangular elastic gusset, allowing the legs to be easily tucked into the boots. Now, this design would more or less be finalized with quartermaster specifications for both the jacket and pants being submitted in the final week of December 1941, well early of the uniform's first use in combat, which came nearly a full year later on November 8, 1942, during Operation Torch. The U.S.'s first engagement in the West by way of a full-scale invasion of North Africa against Vichy French, German, and Italian forces. 
It was here members of the 2nd Battalion 509th Parachute Infantry Regiment saw action. From there, the uniform would continue to be worn as U.S. forces fought their way across Africa and over the Mediterranean into Sicily and eventually Italy. During this time, subtle differences were seen with the M42, be it because of manufacturers or updates to the design. Small things like shading, button composition, and color, as well as pocket flap shapes varied, while others, such as the removal of the elastic triangle on the pant legs, were also also seen. However, the biggest changes were yet to come. Gaining valuable feedback from soldiers wearing the M42s in Africa and Italy, officials saw the need to reinforce many aspects of the pieces as well as modify a few other small things. This came on a mostly unit level as it wasn't exactly a full-on replacement of the standard uniform. These new reinforced versions, sometimes referred to as rigor uniforms due to divisional rigors, those being soldiers in charge of packing, maintaining, repairing, and in this case altering parachutes, strapping, and many other pieces of paratrooper gear taking on the tasks of modification. Though there were slight variances here and there, by and large the primary changes were the addition of olive drab canvas being added to the bottom and lower edges of the waist and thigh billowed pockets, as well as on the elbows and knees. Additionally, two sets of cotton strips were sewn onto the thigh, allowing for wearers to tighten and tie them. This essentially served the same purpose as the waist belt on the jacket. Oftentimes, these uniforms saw uneven and messy stitch work along the reinforced areas, though they did prove to be beneficial for the most part. Though it wasn't seen with every uniform, a bulk of these newer ones were created in the weeks and days leading up to Operation Neptune, or D-Day as it's more well known as. The airborne drops that were a vital part of the invasion of France also saw a few other changes to the uniforms, but again, not an all sweeping and total one. Such additions were the inclusion of large American flags stitched or worn on a shoulder for quick identification, name tapes added above the wearer's left chest pocket, though both of these had been done a fair amount in the years prior, seeing name tapes in different colors and sewn at different angles and most significantly, them being chemically treated. These uniforms were impregnated with an anti-chemical agent called chemical chloramide, or CC2. Before the invasion, the fear that the Germans would use chemical weapons as a response was very real, and so soldiers' uniforms were treated with the agent. Though it was seen as a way to protect troops, the result of the impregnation, that being giving it a horrible smell, darkening and stiffening of the fabric, white residue appearing, and leaving a general slick feel, was mostly panned by the wearers. After the landings and fighting, when soldiers were relieved or pulled from combat, most of these uniforms would be collected and destroyed, or simply replaced with a standard one, though the practice of boiling away the CC2 was also widely seen. Overall though, the M42 would continue to be worn until the war's end as many airborne forces were able to keep using them until Germany's surrender, even with the new universal M1943 uniform system really taking hold. Afterwards, numerous pieces would survive, seeing all sorts of variations and modifications beyond the ones mentioned, partially due to each soldier often being issued three sets. Such things included, but were not limited to, additional pockets added to the coat, such as on sleeves and inside it, patches sewn and stencils added for rank and identification purposes, and custom camouflaging applied, usually by way of spray paint. On the topic of camouflage, it is worth noting that the US Army did play around with M42s bearing the frog skin pattern in very small quantities. They didn't really see much, if any, action on the battlefield, but rather were experimented with primarily in the United States, with glimpses of them coming in the form of photos seen in training ephemera, magazines, and other propaganda material. Moving into the post-war period, the uniform as a whole was eventually retired and replaced with the M1943s, being seen through the later half of the 1940s and into the 50s, including the Korean War. However, by the mid-50s, with the escalation in Vietnam looming, the uniforms made a comeback, sort of. It's a bit all over the place, but essentially the overall design of the M1942, that being the Bush-style jacket with slant pockets, cargo pants with larger thigh pockets, and overall general design of the whole uniform, was evaluated and transferred over to the Tropical Combat Uniform. It was first tested and quickly adopted for Special Forces operating in South Vietnam in 1962, eventually being adopted for all field use in 1963, and then for all Army personnel in the country from 1967 onwards, but that is a whole other story. Today, the M42, or at least elements of it, can still be seen in many of the US military's combat uniforms. Be it large billow and pleated cargo pockets on the BDUs and DCUs, slanted chest pockets of the MCCUUs or ACUs, or just the general safari jacket styling seen on numerous others. Like various other garments and items of the Second World War, it was highlighted in a major way, 
thanks to the HBO show Band of Brothers, which followed Easy Company of the 506th Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne. From a collector's standpoint today, anything associated with airborne troops has become a hot item, partially due to the show, but mainly because of the scarcity of certain pieces. Standard M42s can often fetch a few thousand US dollars, but other more rare items such as M41s and reinforced M42s now frequently sell for upwards of 10,000, though much cheaper reproductions are abundant. But with that, we've more or less covered the history of this iconic uniform that has helped pave the way in some way, shape, or form for numerous US uniforms that came after it, many of which themselves helped inspire countless others. If you enjoyed the video, perhaps leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. If not, all good. Just be sure to check back soon for more of the history of right here on Uniform History.